Lee Symes, who is a developer at Catalyst in Auckland, who has kindly flown all this way to come and see us and to talk about kittens. Lee Symes. Another thing. Woo! Oh. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking um, about some amazing stuff and a lot about kittens. Um, so, first kitten shot, obligatory, right? Um, a little bit about me. So I, I worked for Catalyst for a year and a half. Um, I basically went straight there out of uni. Um, and yeah, I'm writing a lot of Python, JavaScript, PHP. Uh, a little bit of Perl here and there. Um, I've also touched Golang. It's a really cool language, but I just haven't had the chance to actually dive in. Um, also, I have depression and anxiety. And to be quite honest, neither have been very useful. Um, yeah, that was great fun. Um, so, yeah, this talk was finished last night at 11 o'clock. Um, yeah, just because I've been putting it off for so long. Um, so, without further ado, um, so first of all, uh, we're using the Flickr API because they seem like a good way to get a lot of the kitten photos. And there's a couple of quirks with the Flickr API that I'm kind of just parking off to one side. And if you want to have a look at what they're doing, you can grab the code. Um, but basically, what we're going to do is we're going to use a list of my predetermined kittens. Um, and for each picture, we're going to get the metadata so that we can say, you know, this kitten was, t photograph was taken by this person. It's copyright CC by SA. Um, we also need to get the download link. And then we, obviously and then we actually need to download the picture. Um, and finally, we can store that metadata and generate some HTML for it. Um, so, I, like I mentioned, uh, CodeWise just extracted a whole heap of stuff out of the code that we're going to see. Just because the, um, yeah, there's quite a few things with the Flickr API. It seems to be based around XML rather than JSON, which means you get some quirks. It's quite fun to work with. Um, and we're using requests because that's just kind of obligatory with all any HTTP stuff. So, wow, that font is really bad. Oops. <laughs> um, sorry if you can't see that. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. Tech guys? Uh, hold on, there, there we go. I have a cursor. Ah, is that better? Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I'm not going to live update my code. <laughs> um, so basically what we're doing is we're just um, preparing uh, the request to go out to Flickr um, because of the way it does JSON callbacks and all this stuff. You have to add a whole heap of things to make it work. Um, and then we're just going to check whether the status code, get the JSON out, and return it. Um, so th this is basically just a way of compacting that code into a single function call. So that when we actually want to get the image, we just make a single uh, API call out to the info one. Uh, so a single API call to get info, and then another API call to get sizes, which is the download links. Um, then we call out some extra functions that basically parse all that response, throw it all together into a nice dictionary, um, and we can now update that data. Um, so now we've got all that information stored. Uh, and without right clicking. So then we basically can just download, uh, download the image and write it out to a file. Um, and then we return the photo data so that we can store it. Um, so throwing that all together, basically a quick main method um, the writer just writes out a HTML file, makes sure everything's tidied away, and also times it, um, because that's important. Um, and basically, we're downloading four of them, one after the other. Um, so here are your four kittens. They're kind of cute. Um, by the way, I was expecting a couple more, like, awes. <laughs> you know, like, aww. I'll do it for you, it's OK. <laughs> Um, that took 12 and a half seconds. Um, on my home network, because it's really bad, it takes about 45. Um, so but we can go faster, because really what we're doing is we're making a request, and then we're waiting for Flickr to you know, do its thing, and then come back to us. And then we're making another request, and waiting for Flickr, and then it comes back. So we're going to be using AsyncIO um, and AIO HTTP. Um, AIO HTTP is basically 
requests but for async IO. Uh, it's got much the same um, you know, syntax uh, API. Um, it also has a server built in, uh, like server side stuff as well. So it's kind of like Flask and requests combined with AIO or async IO and everything just kind of in one library, which is cool. Um, so a very quick async primer. That actually reads all right. Cool. Um, so we're, uh, I'm not going to be talking about async from Python 3.3 or 3.4. Um, it's possible to do async I.O. stuff in those. Um, it's just that in Python 3.5, there were new language constructs, the specifically async and await, that were added. Um, so, and it just makes code look nicer and cleaner and beautiful. Pythonic. Um, so async def basically creates an asynchronous function. Um, it allows you to use your other async keywords like async for and async with. Also allows you to do a wait, um, and it prevents you from doing yield and yield from. Um, and the reason we don't allow yield and yield from is because what the await keyword does is effectively does a yield from. Um, await pauses that function um, until that call's completed. So if we were to await uh, get request to Google, um, the event loop would still be able to process other things, say if we're doing a whole heap of requests off to different sites, those would all still be processed. But the function that's doing that request off to Google would pause until the requests come back and it's got the data, and then the function can continue. Um, and that's all managed by the event loop. So, and this is going to be awkward for a while. Um, we're going to import async IO. Uh, we're just going to define a print hello world um, to say hello to Kiwi PyCon. Um, we're going to print preparing to say hello, then we're going to sleep for five seconds. Um, we're not using time.sleep because time.sleep would effectively block the entire event loop, which means nothing can happen for five seconds. Whereas this asyncio.sleep is basically saying to the event loop, in five seconds, wake me back up, but go and do other stuff if you've got other stuff to do. Um, and then we obviously print hello and so when we call it down here, um, what happens? Well, nothing. Um, and the reason is, is that you actually need a bit of infrastructure around this asynchronous function, uh, the event loop, um, to actually make it run. Um, so basically the same, the same sort of code up here, except we are adding a couple more sleeps because um, I'm tired. Um, and we're now going to get an event loop, and we're going to say run this function until it's complete. And that basically starts the event loop, and the event loop does its thing. And once that function completes, it will return control back to here, and we can print by. So I'm obviously going to be very polite. Um, and then one second later, I'm going to prepare to say hello. And then, hello, Kiwi PyCon. Um, and then one second after that, the print hello world function will exit, which means that the code will now continue down here, and we'll say bye. Right, I'm out of here. Um, so that's your very first async function. Woohoo! Yay! Okay. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> Rocky. And okay. Um, so. I, I, we're all waiting for your very first async kitten, because um, we've already got sync kittens at the moment. It's a bit, it's a bit sad. Um, so we're going to be using uh, AIO HTTP. Let me just find my cursor again. Um, so that's kind of the first bit there. So it, obviously you need to import the library. Um, we're going to async def, um, just so that we can use those await keywords. And then we're going to use this async with. Um, it's basically like a with block you know, like the context managers that you've all used, you know, with files and this sort of thing, except what you can do is when you, when you enter, or the enter method can do stuff asynchronously, and the exit method can do stuff asynchronously. So in this case, what's happening is the enter method is actually doing the request and waiting until the response comes, or the headers for the response comes back before allowing us to carry on. So when we're in that block, it's, um, so once we reach this image line here, it's 
great, got on, off to the server and come back and said, we've got headers. Fantastic. <coughs> then, obviously, we raise the status just to make sure we haven't misplaced an image or something. And then we have to wait for it to read the whole image as well. We can't just, we, we can't just assume that the whole thing's being read right now. Um, especially if it's a large image, it will take some time. And we don't want to block for that either, because um, something else might want to happen. Um, and then we basically store that in content. And then when we exit that with block, um, AsyncIO will basically do a whole heap of cleanup, like closing connections and doing all these other things that we don't care about, but it just does it. And it's all asynchronous, so we're not blocking event loops um, or anything like that. Uh, so. I think that's really cool. Um, so up next, basically then we just write out that content. Um, the reason we're not doing a, like an asynchronous write, from my understanding, is that Linux doesn't really support the notion of an asynchronous write to disk. Um, and thus, the Python async library doesn't support the notion of an asynchronous write to disk. So it's all synchronous writing. Um, and then another thing is just this asynchronous main method. Um, it's basically like your main method, except basically I tend to write it with a main method that basically just bootstraps the asynchronous main method. So this is your main function. Um, oh, questions? No, oh, okay. Um, and we're just going to download that. Um, and then we're just going to say run that and then exit. Um, which gets us that. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. This slide, the, the, this talk was kind of hard to write. Can you see why? <laughs> <laughs> um, and that took ten and a half seconds on my home network. Um, I've run this on various places, and I haven't updated that time. But that was at home, and it, it was all right. Um, Surprising, you can still watch Netflix, but Google homepage is a bit touchy. Um, I don't know. <laughs> New Zealand networking. Um, yeah, so what if we wanted to download two kitten pictures, though, right? Well, we could download one, and then we could download the next one, but we're asynchronous, so we could download them both at the same time and wait until they're both done, and then say we're all done. So we try and run it in parallel. Um, basically, we've got exactly that same um, get kitten method. Nothing's changed up there. Um, and then what down here, what we're doing is we basically change the main method to say, wait on the results of both of these get kitten calls. So uh, the gather will basically wait until all of those results have come back and return them as a tuple. Um, hence the sort of like tired face. Um, syntax there. Um, we obviously don't need the results, it's not returning anything, it doesn't do anything useful, but it's good to know that it's actually returning something. Um, and the same thing, we're just going to run that. Um, which gives us those two kittens. Oh. Oh. This talk's going to run long, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So, okay. Um, how can we apply this back to what we were doing just a few minutes ago with the downloading four kittens? Um, oh. oh, no, I've completely lost track of time. So, sorry. The um, time-wise, it's not, it, it's faster, right? Um, the downloading one and then the next one. Um, so that took 14 seconds. I think that's just because my network doesn't really like handling a lot of requests. Um, it seems to be able to download things quick enough, but yeah, um, it's weird. But basically, the, the whole thing is is that that's downloaded faster, five seconds faster. I'd say five seconds and I have two kittens now. Um, you know, in case of emergencies, that five seconds could be a, you know, important five seconds. Um, so anyway, back to the kitten at hand. Um, or bush. <laughs> um, so what we were doing previously, we were getting info, and then we were getting the sizes, and then we were downloading a kitty picture, and then we were rinsing and repeating. We get the info, get the sizes, 
Next kitten picture. Next kitten. Well, we could do even better, because if we get the info for two kittens at the same time, or all the kittens at the same time, and get the sizes for all of them, and then download the kitten picture for all of them, we can go even faster, because we're no longer waiting for a slow request. We're waiting for a couple of slow requests to come back and say, and, and be done. But if one of them takes a long time and another one doesn't, it's not actually... Uh, I, I lost my trail of thought again. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> distracted by a kitten. <laughs> oh dear. Um, so it, it's going to run faster because we're not actually waiting for every single request. We, they're all running in parallel. We're only waiting for the slowest ones because the fastest ones will just finish and be waiting on, on the side. Then the slowest one will be whatever is taking, whatever holds us up. So how do we implement this? Well, first of all, we need to update our API call um, because previously it was synchronous um, and we can't really call synchronous code because otherwise it's, it, it, it blocks the event loop. You can't, it's a very bad idea to block the event loop because then nothing else can happen. So basically, updated API call method. Um, that block, the update thing is exactly the same. Um, we're just going to do a, another get request. Uh, this time we're using a session that gets passed in. Um, basically, it allows us to do pooling, um, client connection pooling. Uh, waiting for that JSON. Again, because we don't know whether all that data has come through, we still ha we have to wait for the data. Um, the only guarantee uh, when you enter that with block is that you've got headers. Um, and then we just do some quick checks and return that data. Um, so how are we actually going to... Oh, I need to change that colour scheme. Really sorry. I'm really sorry. I didn't realise it was going to be quite that bad. Um, yeah, I promise not to live edit. Um, <laughs> so oh, that actually works. Okay, cool. Um, so what we're going to do, first of all, is wait for the first API call and then wait for the second API call. But they're not actually going to block any other API calls from starting. So what's actually going to start? What's actually going to happen is when the main method starts, it's going to run four of these in parallel. And then each one is going to start off its own API call um, independent of the others. And then when the first one of those comes back, it's going to send off the next API call. And that means that we no longer just, we don't have a lot of idle time in between that we're actually able to do stuff. Um, the same block of code there. And then downloading the kitten is basically just, uh, again, the same thing as before. It's very repetitive, isn't it? Um, uh, um, open up an action, download the content, write it out to a file. Fantastic. Um, and return the photo data. And then throwing it all together again because I picked a bad colour scheme. Did that. Um, again, here we're using, <coughs> I try not to kill myself, gather to get all of the kitten data because this actually returns stuff. We want to hold all of it. And then we're going to add it all to the writer so that the writer can output it nicely, and then so that my really, really hacky JavaScript can display it, a nice slideshow like this. Um, really cute kitten. Another really cute kitten. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Aww. Aww. So, downloading synchronously took 12 and a half seconds. Um, downloading asynchronously took four, um, and this is a, this is this change is even bigger on, on my home network. It's like forty-five down to twenty. Uh, it's actually it's quite a lot faster because we're not just spinning our wheels. We're able to do stuff um, in parallel and make it faster. So, can we go even faster? Well, yes. Because the way I designed this intentionally was so that we didn't actually need the get info call in order to download the kitten picture and write that out to a file. So we could do the, download, the get info call and the get sizes and download kitten call in separate like, lines of execution, make it go even faster. 
So I'm basically running through. Uh, um, how am I doing for time? Oh, wow, that's 20 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, uh, so basically, we're going to make that API call, and then we're going to call out to another method that um, basically does the download stuff. But the these are going to be running parallel. Um, and then we just return that. So, there we go. Uh, I'm really sorry. There we go. Please work. So, um, great, I've lost my trail of thought again. Can I blame all the kittens again? Is that, yeah? Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so, this is actually doing the download. We're just going to wait for that API call. And we're going to then get the, basically split those two blocks out. Um, yeah. So does that run even faster? I don't remember. Um, <laughs> I interesting story. Uh, it runs slower on my home network, the, the, the more efficient one. Um, basically, yeah. Um, when I ran it last night off my off the hotel Wi-Fi, it um, it seemed to run a bit faster. There you go, one second. Yay, save a life. Um, so, why why didn't it run faster at home? I, I guess the thing is is that now we're doing eight requests. There's a lot of rec like requests starting happening, opening connections, all this sort of thing. Um, the my home network is obviously very bad at with high latency, but good throughput. So opening lots of connections is kind of bad. Um, but yeah, it's something you've got to experiment with. And if you if you're on a fast network like at work, this is the faster way to go. Um, so basically, what I wanted to show was it's actually quite easy to move through and basically make your code ridiculously fast. Um, API calls, asynchronous, all over the place. Um, the whole thing is that I didn't, it's a relatively small amount of code change from, for what I've done. I mean, it's a relatively small amount of code, but the whole thing is to allow your code to run in parallel. That way you can actually achieve things faster without you know, waiting for some server in the middle of nowhere or Sydney. Um, to, you know, finish or get rained out. That was great fun. Um, you know, yeah, they should really invest in umbrellas down in Sydney. With all that AWS outage. Um, so now what? Um, it's actually really easy to do a couple of things. Um, so rate limiting API calls is ridiculously easy. I wrote five lines of code. Um, if you want to do stuff like that, um, you just basically bound in semaphore. Um, bound in semaphore limits the number of things that will enter this block here. Um, nice and easy. Um, other things like if you wanted to say, say you've got a list of issues on GitHub that you want to download. Um, You've, you obviously at the moment are probably going through first page, second page, third page, fourth page. And you think, okay, well, I can't really speed that up with async because I need to get the first page before I can get the second page. I need to get the second page before I can get the third page. But there are a couple of tricks that I learned when I was doing some stuff with JavaScript, which is that they give you the last page as well. So you can work from the top going down. And once you've made that first request, the bottom going up half the time that you're actually getting this whole listing. Um, that was quite interesting. I didn't have time to actually hack something out to do that, but um, maybe by the end of the conference I will. Um, yeah, so, and what on earth was the difference between those two things? Oh well, okay. Um, also proper rate limiting of say only five requests every second. I've kind of hacked something together, it's a little bit bad. Um, that's, it's up on code, come on GitHub. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, I just want to thank a couple of people. Um, basically, every single one of these people has kept me alive, literally. Like, 
literally kept me alive um, for the past two or three months. Um, there have been some really tough times, and without them, I wouldn't be here. Um, so, thank you. Um, yeah, so, any questions before I completely tear up? <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello? Yes, it is, appears to be okay. on. Um, when you tag a function with an async keyword, y can you still apply Python decorators to such a function? Yes, it's still a function. Um, so the decorator should be just a plain def, but you can also like decorate a function. So you can decorate an async function with a an async function, if that makes sense. Hold on, let me grab some code. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> let me just change my theme so that people can see it. Um, uh, oh yeah, um, sorry, I didn't mean to grab everyone. Um, basically, you, you're able to decorate async functions with async functions. Um, let me get out of that view. Can I go back to Atom? There we go. Uh, I'd like another question. Cool. Sorry. Let me just go back here. Thanks for the talk. Um, complete sort of newbie question. How does this stuff play inside a web framework where you've got a, a process running requests? Does it does it kind of just work or do they kind of need to be changed to uh, handle asynchronous? So stuff? if we're talking about things like Django, um, not sure. Uh, if you're talking about something like, um, so AIO HTTP has its own server framework. Uh, inbuilt, which basically does everything asynchronously. So um, you can always, so if, you, if you're writing something new um, and you use the AIO HTTP server framework, you can get the, you can basically get the request and do an async, do a whole heap of async stuff whilst the request's happening. And you won't be blocking other requests from happening because they're also async. But as for adding it to something like a, a Django or an existing project, it's probably a bit harder. Um, you might be able to do something if you had, say, you might be able to do something with um, like creating a brand new event loop just for that request. If you wanted to basically, well, you could use the event loop. Um, you just have to manage it a bit more carefully. Um, so if you, let me just go back to, this slide here, you could, in theory, have that be your request handler um, and basically have your async main function do the asynchronous handling of your request, like making seven API calls all at once. Um, but it's a bit more infrastructure to just manage, I guess. Um, yeah, any other questions? Oh, hey, and a couple. Oh, there's one at the back. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you. A uh, quick question about the async main loop. Does it have any relationship to the number of threads or cores on the machine? No, it's all single threading. Uh, it's uh, one thread, um, one, yeah, one Python process, one thread. Um, but the whole thing is, is that it won't, if you're doing, for example, a HTTP request, the, the whole thing is, is it won't block the thread for that HTTP request. Other things can do other things. Um, and that's kind of what the point of this is. Um, you are able to spawn threads and you are able to call between async IO's event loop and the thread and back again, which might be a thing to do for longer running tasks, um, possibly like HTML parsing. If it's getting a bit too much for the one thread, you might want to throw that in another thread. But no, it's all single thread. All right, we'll make this the last question. Oh, can we make it the second last and have this oh, gentleman? Sure. Uh, this uh, may be a silly question because I'm stuck in the Python 2 world, but does this um, supersede concurrent.futures? No. Um, concurrent.futures uh, works with the multi-processing library, I believe, um, and that still works in Python 3. Um, there's a future, there's an async IO future which kind of reflects that of the concurrent futures, but it's 
async I/O based. Um, this is kind of a bit separate from concurrent futures and multiprocessing. One last question. Thank you. Um, so, so this is uh, the example you gave there. That is uh, mostly blocking on uh, I/O requests. And uh, traditionally, for these sort of things, I guess a multi-threaded approach would work as well. Because you know, um, so where would you see? Uh, uh, how would you decide whether or not you would do something like this as just multiple threads, or using something like this, uh, which has a bit more different-looking uh, code that one has to get used to first? Yeah, um, I, I don't really know what. Um so for me, the benefit with this is that I know exactly when my code is going to go off somewhere else, which means that I can use mutable structures and all these sorts of things. So for example, I had some, if I can find it, uh, da -da -da -da. I had some co sample code that I'd written um, for the rate limiting thing. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. See if we can find a different theme. Okay, hold on. Hey, is that better? Okay, fantastic. Um, well, whoever's going to see this talk next is going to have a great experience. Thank you all for playtesting. Um, so here, I'm basically I'm mutating this global list. But the thing is, is I always know that nothing else is going to be mutating that list. Uh, that list is not going to change. Or not, no, has no chance of changing until we hit one of these await keywords or an async with keyword or something like that. So the whole the whole thing is a bit more easy to reason about, in my opinion. So I know that this function, once it reaches say here, is going to always run through to here without any other code touching anything. I have control and I'm this is this is what the entire Python, um, well, this entire Python thread is doing. Um, I, I, yeah, that's one of the one of the benefits I see. Um, and plus, you don't have to manage threads if that's something that is easy or hard for you. Um, I haven't done a lot of threading in Python. Um, yeah, cool. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. The next talk will be in about 20 minutes. Lee Symes. Woo! I made it! <laughs>